Welcome to the Audio Setup Wizard. Yes, hello, young ladies. Hi. Good, good afternoon. Recording started. Yes, assalamu alaikum. Uh, we will start our class now, and which is going to cover uh, chapters, uh, I think, seven and eight, right? We have just uh, finished last class. Uh, all uh, the previous chapters, including uh, the previous classes' chapters, which are five and six. Is that right? Today, we look at the the last the few chapters, two of them for today, and next class we finish the book. So next week, inshallah, is going to uh, uh, be some questions and uh, um, discussion of what we have been doing and referring to some of the uh, chapters that you don't uh, understand or you have question in. So it will be some kind of a week of uh, all material that is related to what we have already discussed. So today, we uh, <clears throat> uh, we will cover <clears throat> chapters seven and eight. <clears throat> yes, Nora, that's what I'm saying. Uh, the revision is going to be next week. So this week. We're going to have this class and after tomorrow's class to finish the, the whole book. So the chapters we are going to discuss today, inshallah, are language, <coughs> and nation, as well as chapter 8 which is language and geography. Okay, inshallah. Now language and nation, of course, languages are related to uh, their own countries or nations. And the uh, uh, situation is not always straightforward. There are some politics in some nations. There are some uh, multi-language problems in other nations, etc. That's what we are going to do, to look at today. Um, okay. As far as the beginning of the chapter is concerned, um, the nations that are discussed are uh, in Uganda. Uganda is a good example because it has uh, uh, or is a multi multilingual nation. So it's a good example to to see, to have a to have a look at and discuss. Switzerland. another nation where more than two languages, three languages are involved, as well as Cameroon in Africa. Okay. And uh, Papua New Guiana. New Guiana. Also in Africa, where there are many languages uh, in, uh, involved in that nation, nations, as well as nations such as, uh, you know, Nor Norway, Sweden, Finland, Russia, and Spain and France, and all, all of the nations. But these, these countries in particular would have these kinds of... Do you hear me? Is, is the voice okay with everybody? Thank you. Thank you, Nama, very much. Thank you, Noura, and Afnan, and 
all of you. Thank you so much, Fatma. Okay, well done. So if you have the books in front of you, if you don't have the books, that's fine. We can, you can always catch up later. But I mean, if you have the books, see the beginning. Okay? The beginning uh, of the book, which are pages. Okay, that's good, Nora. That's excellent. Pages 119. 120, 121, you know, uh, etc. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm seeing now on page number one there is uh, the actual uh, uh, reminder of everybody that in the previous chapter uh, we noted two things about the sociolinguistic situation in Kampala. Kampala is the capital of Uganda. Two things. The first thing is many individuals were either bilingual or multilingual. Do you know what is the difference between bilingual, bilingual and multilingual? Uh, yeah, Any bi is two. Bi uh, is uh, when you know. Uh, uh, two languages in speaking to be able to speak and understand and use two languages like you are bilingual and there is multi means what multilingual means that if you know uh, um, uh, to know Many. So we use the word many languages. Uh, always expected to be uh, to be more than three. More than three. Why? Uh, yes, uh, Afnan. Yeah, more than two. Well, more than three, why? Because if you know three languages, you will be called trilingual. Tri is for three. So this is why multi, sorry, multi, I should have written it like that. Multi. Multilingual. Multi is more than three. Many. And that's what it means. And this multilinguality, many individuals in Uganda, for example, could speak more than more than one language with a fair degree of proficiency. You know, it's not only speaking like when we say we can speak French, uh, merci, au revoir, you know, things like that. No, no, no. It's knowing the language and mastering it. You know how to communicate and you understand well. That's knowing the language. Germany is another example. But in Uganda, the situation is complicated. We will see in a minute, Yanura and everybody. So this is the first thing we learned last, last um, in the previous chapter. The second thing is that this was a consequence of the fact that the society in which they lived was a multilingual society. That's why people had to learn it and they don't discuss it, they just learn it so that they can have ease in communication. So individual bilingualism of this part is not actually a necessary consequence of a social or nation multilingualism like Canada. Canada is a nation of multilingualism, French and English. There are multilingual societies where many speakers never become bilingual uh, to any significant degree, such as Switzerland, for example. And individual bilingualism, although very much more widespread than the average, like Germany and Nora as well. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be bilingual, but in Uganda the situation is that um, the situation in the society imposes itself on uh, the inhabitants and uh, on the world scale, multilingual situation that obtains in Uganda is the rule rather than the exception. So the rule there is to learn more than one language. 
and the vast majority of the nation states uh, uh, states of the world, I mean in the world itself, all the world generally, uh, would have, I mean, more than one language spoken by the indigenous. You know, spoken indigenous, indigenously, like in, I want you to learn that word, de, j, mostly. Uh, it means uh, uh, the original inhabitant. What does it mean in Arabic, in indigen indigenously? Indigenous means the, the original inhabitant. What does it mean in Arabic, if you can think about the word? Come on girls, Noura, mashallah, another Noura. Yeah, Lulwa, all of you, what do you think the word indigenous means? Uh, more than Adat, ya Noura. يعني محليين المحليين الناس المحليين بالضبط the the original people of the country so it when when a nation is known to be multilingual or bilingual the Uganda it doesn't become يعني not تقاليد as far as language is concerned يعني all of these معناها يعني وطني it's in the country, the people in the country, which who are the محليين, الناس اللي هم the original people of that country. They must le learn the languages. It doesn't become their own choice because they can't communicate if, you don't, if they, they don't learn them. So these uh, nations are not that many. But we can make, yeah, locally, bravo alayki, yes, local people or original people, yes, afnan. Um, in the world, worldwide, let us do it this way, another conclusion, worldwide, it is not possible. possible anymore to find a nation that is a monolingual. What does that mean? And I'm looking at you to this statement in the exam, asking you to discuss it. You would, if you read this chapter, you would be able to give me a few points. Discussion not in writing, 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 but put them in points. And with understanding the situation, then you can re present me with a couple of points or three points which are real ones. Let's see them now. Try to try to uh, um, focus on this statement, which is an, uh, a good uh, point for questioning. So here it is difficult, and the difficulties only arise when one attempts to locate a country that is genuinely monolingual. Uh, there appear to be very few of them in the world, even in Europe. There aren't many true examples. True examples, most people would accept as true statements of the effect that Germans, for example, speak German, the French speak French, you know, the Italians speak Italian, Iceland speak I Icelandic. But in reality, when it comes to, this is their native variety of language. Like us, we speak Arabic. This is our native variety of Arabic. By the way, they speak Filipino, Tagalog, you know, quite uh, fluently. And uh, some Indian languages like Hindi or Urdu, some of them, because because we, they have, I mean, in Mecca, I was really surprised to see people from Mecca, and it's Saudi, it's Adi, and they have to speak those varieties of languages. Fil Haram, Fil Haram al Makki. They talk to people because they have them, and for quite different reasons. Taban in Mecca, we understand why. In uh, Jeddah, in Bahrain, in all of these places, in the earth, English is spoken and understood now by the majority of people, and it's not like before. So that is the situation. It depends on the nation itself and its historical and uh, social context. So multi multilingualism is a very widespread phenomena indeed. That's why multilingualism 
is a very wide spread phenomena or phenomenon and then we say indeed indeed uh, because the world uh, starts to deal with uh, communicating with one another at a higher level quickly with all these means of communication and the spread of all means of uh, uh, connecting with the world like what we are doing now with the blackboard and with the WhatsApp and the computer and all these communi communicative uh, uh, devices and processes and the world started to be more uh, like you know so these are the conditions or part of the conditions where the vast majority where it proves that the vast majority of the nation states of the world have more than one language language spoken indigenously, محليًا, indigenously within their frontiers, يعني inside the borders. مش عشان نقول إنه it's because of this and because of that. In Turkey, I went there and I visited there. Turkish people, most of them know Arabic, especially the Syrian Arabic. And the number of languages may rise into the hundreds in some societies. And let's look at, uh, yeah. So here, for example, in Iceland, there are 100, there is 100% 100 of the indigenous population are Icelandic speaking. And it is an exception rather than the norm. Uh, this Iceland. But in some cases, where the minority are relatively large, the nation state usually has more than one official language. For example, in Belgium, what do they have in Belgium? Any idea? Yes? In Belgium, how many languages officially they have? Dutch is often known as Flemish in Belgium. Yani Dutch is spoken, which is known as, I'll write it down, Flemish. What else? And, uh, and they speak French as well. See? So that's why, I mean, you find Belgium having uh, two languages. Switzerland, on the other hand, it has German, Italian, French, and Romansh. And in Finland itself, there is Finnish, which is the Finland language, the native language, as well as Swedish. Important factor, where the minority is smaller or less influential, the minority language or languages are unlikely to have official status. Okay, that's why when the minority language is used by the minority people with less power or solidarity, if you like, remember these words, then it becomes less likely to be the official language that you find in governmental sectors, in schools, in universities. So this factor uh, would uh, make it uh, possible or a good chance for the society to tend to be bilingual. So this last factor is what helps to give Europe its onwardly monolingual appearance. So the overwhelming majority of French citizens can speak French in spite of the fact that for a number of them it is a second language. Like because in France there are plenty of Algerians and Tunisians and uh, um, <clears throat> Moroccans living there, as an example, there are Africans as well. Each um, uh, group of people have their own mother tongue plus French. So the same sort of situation applies in the United Kingdom. In the UK also gives every appearance of being monolingual, and it shows that as if English is spoken in England, in the UK only, but uh, the visitors certainly need to learn English 
of course, to make sure or to know English, to make sure that they would have no problem in uh, staying there for some time. But in England also there are other languages that use, that is used, that are used. So it's true that England has not had an indigenous linguistic minority since uh, Cornish became extinct in the 18th century, which is one of the linguistic uh, systems. But there are uh, living in country today sizable group of speakers of very many languages from a number of different places around the world, including, for example, the northern Indian uh, subcontinent, such as Punjabi and Bengali. Over there, there are also some grounds for arguing that the first language of many older British people of West Indian origin, not English. And also, this is very similar as in chapter 9 to be discussed later, uh, of the indigenous languages like Welsh uh, is the first language of about 50 fifth of the population of Wales. So there are people with their mother tongue as well, Welsh. Same thing with in Scotland. Scots Gaelic is spoken natively by about 70,000 people, largely in the West Highland and Hybridian uh, islands of Scotland. Okay, can you see that on page 120? Okay, if you all open on page, thank you very much, uh, pages 121 and 122, you find a list, and that list is about languages spoken in different countries. If we write English, English language, we find it spoken in all of these countries. Like, uh, you know, English as being the medium of communication, that language of a medium of communication in the world. So English is not mentioned because of this. Otherwise, there are the languages German, Turkish, Greek, Albanian, Hungarian, Finnish, Swedish, French, and the uh, uh, countries are mentioned beside them, spoken by indigenous uh, linguistic minority. So linguistic minority of Germans are found in Denmark, Belgium, France, Italy, etc., etc. Many countries. German is spoken in all those countries, including Poland, uh, Czechia, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, previously, before 1995, remember when we talked about the split, and Ukraine, in Ukraine, in Hungary, in Russia, in Romania, etc., all of these have German in them. Uh, Turkish language, we found spoken in Greece, you know, Macedonia, remember Macedonia in Hungary, in, uh, uh, sorry, in uh, the previous Czechoslovakia when we were discussing that, and there is also Turkish spoken in the in Bulgaria, in Romania, in Moldova, in Ukraine. Greek is spoken in all of these countries. Turkish, Romania, Ukraine, Italy, etc., etc. And Danish is spoken in the, the, uh, Germany. Dutch is spoken in France. I'm just picking some, uh, you know, random. Macedonian is spoken in Greece and Albania, and it goes around like that because of communication and people uh, and communicating with each other. On page 20, 122, there is a language that is called Sami. I want you to look at that. Sami L A double P. Uh, can you see that? You don't have to memorize that, yeah, Nora. But I mean. Uh, uh, and everybody, of course, but you need to look at them and realize the fact because I might give you data and you will be able to see the data properly and analyze and so on. Can you see Sami language? Sami, Sami Lapish, Lapish language? This is mentioned also on page number 123 as well as 
uh, whereabouts. I mean, it's both my side, Sami, Sami language. They call it Sami minority language. And that Sami minority language, good to learn about it because uh, it formulates a kind of minority because there are minority languages everywhere. So there are some of these uh, where the language that is presented in minority and people have to learn the language in the school before uh, they are admitted to the school. So where do we find that Sami? Sami language is like it's here. Uh, Sami language uh, as a minority language, you can find it on pages also. Pages uh, 126 uh, uh, and 127. It's discussed in more detail, but it's mentioned on also mentioned on pages 122, 123, uh, that Sami language, and 128, okay, and uh, 192. So that's why, I mean, you need to see what, what do they talk, what, what did they say about that? About Sami is uh, the, that kind, those kind of people who are called blackish. Sami Lap in uh, those people Lapish, okay, which are, who are found uh, in Sweden somewhere, and they don't know Swedish, but I mean they, these countries Sweden or uh, any you know um, uh, Dutch and all these uh, countries. Uh, are very strict and they only learn one type of language probably in schools. So those Lapish people don't know except their own Lapish language minority. Also Frisian is an example of language minority and it is spoken in Germany, Netherlands. So the, the Sami Lap is spoken in minority in the countries Norway, Sweden, Finland and Russia. And also the Basque language is uh, spoken in some parts of Spain and France. Some uh, same thing with uh, Catalan. These are all language minorities. Also Breton in France and Serb Sorbian in Germany, Kashubian in, in Poland, and Welsh in the United Kingdom, as well as Gaelic in the United Kingdom. You see. So the problem with those languages, minority, is that because they are minority, as we said earlier, this is what you need to worry about, you know, um, Munira and everybody. And you should know why are these language minorities problematic. Because they are minority, we said it earlier, and I wrote it in my statement before, that because they are minority, they become languages that are not found in... Uh, the formal uh, context in the society, in the nation, and they are kind of ignored. So uh, people who learn them as their mother tongue can't join the schools if they don't know the language that is used in schools, such as, for example, that Sami Lap, Lapish, minority language. And they have to learn, for example, Swedish, uh, or Frisian or Dutch to be able to join the schools of those uh, nations. Okay, uh, these are situations of languages in nations. So nearly all European nations are multilingual because of the you know the development and the openness and, and everything. Um, in addition to those minority languages, there is Yiddish. Yiddish is the language of the Jews. Yiddish, Judeo, Jud, Judeo, German, and uh, uh, Romani, which is a gypsy language as well, are minority and are quite wide spoken in minority languages in different parts of the uh, European continent. 
So the unusual case is Irish Gaelic, uh, which will be mentioned here below, you know, and also the uh, Welsh and uh, the uh, Gaelic languages of Scotland and Ireland and Wales. Uh, because the government would stop using these languages and make them as part of the system of education. So uh, native speakers of those languages will only ex uh, be exposed to their own mother tongue at home and with their family and parents and so on. But then they will be kept away from them in writing and in school and in teaching and so on. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, accurate numbers are not available, of course, of people or speaking, uh, the minority people speaking their own mother tongue. But for example, Romani-speaking gypsies continue uh, or constitute a large minority, large minority, with at least 10% of the population, while other large minorities as Hungarians, Germans, and Jews who speak Yiddish uh, or in uh, some cases, Ladino, which is Judeo Spanish, and other minority languages include Russia, or Russian, Ukrainian, Serbian, Slovak, Tatar, Turkish, Bulgarian, Czech, Greek, and Romanian, are found, and Armenian, are found spoken in minor in in some other countries. Now, for multilingualism, i.e., more than two, three, and above. On the scale, on the large, on this large scale of nations, bringing problems for government. You see, so that's why we uh, we learn languages with the relation to nation because government is involved. So the government is concerned, becomes concerned, and uh, for obvious kinds, any organizations of obvious kinds. So multilingualism on any other scale. Uh, who also brings with uh, its problems. So because of bringing problems, especially those who are members of the linguistic minority, unlike members of the majority language group, they have to acquire proficiency in at least two languages before they can function as full members, i.e. before joining the school and working in the society and function as full members of the nation community in which they live. The biggest problem, of course, is education. I always uh, mention it, education. So here, because uh, in, in, in uh, multilingual societies, uh, it becomes too severe for those minority people because the two, if there are two languages involved, it may not be particularly different than the two languages involved, like the Frisian language and the Dutch language, because Frisian and Dutch are very close. But the Sami children, the Sami Lak, from Latish children, learn learning Swedish, since Frisian and Dutch are quite closely related languages. Or it may be that the educational policy of the country concerned is reasonably intelligent and sophisticated linguistically. And the children uh, are always uh, the targeted case. Poor people learn and read and write in uh, and are taught through the medium of their native, native tongue, not, not their own native mm -hmm. tongue. Can you see the problem with me? Um, I'm looking at page 123. Mm -hmm. I hope you are following with me. So the approach has been adopted in many parts of Wales, for example, in the UK, as well as in Norway and other places. Its aim or its aim are that the children should acquire an ability to read, write, and speak both their native language and the majority language. Why did they? Why do they say that? Because in the UK, at one uh, period of time, the UK government presented people 
to use their own mother tongue from Wales and from uh, Scotland. And they used to punish them and put them in prison. If they happened to even listen them to talk to their parents using their own uh, uh, their own mother tongue, which is Welsh or Gaelic. But then this has stopped. Turkish government did the same thing with the, with the Kurdish minority, punishing them and stopped recognizing them. So they are more like political and governmental reasons and uh, instructions more than anything else. So that's why it becomes part of the nation's problem. So here, this, in England, this was formerly true for both Welsh in Wales and Gaelic language in Scotland. At one time, a law was in force that actually made the speaking of Gaelic illegal, and they prevented people to speak it, to use it, and was for many years the policy of the Turkish government until, you know, those committees, communities of uh, human rights started to fight for stopping this kind of severe and unfair kind of rules. Okay, so the effect of the attempted imposition of an alien nation language such as English on Turkish may be very serious. This is on the other hand, when you go to Turkey, people don't know English. They don't want to, you know, study it in schools or use it. Okay, and in England, well, well, Sorry, Welsh was and Gaelic were considered as uh, inferior, yani less uh, ranked, ranked on the lower rank than English language. It was to that extent, yani it was really racist. And Kurds was, was, was the same thing. On page uh, 124, the discussion moves to include something else, like uh, uh, plus all these punishments and the suffering of the minority people of those minority languages and so on. Um, same thing was done with the American, the Native American Indians. Today, considerable provision is made for some minority groups, notably notably Spanish speakers and Native American Indians to be educated in their own language. Previously, they were used as slaves or as inferior to the American language. Same thing, it's racism. But now the view has changed. So public notices in New York City, for example, are now posted in both Spanish as well as English to cater for the large Petro, Petro Rican from, no, yeah, per, per, Puerto, sorry, Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican community uh, now living there. However, the larger, more rural linguistic minorities, such as those consisting of speakers of French in the uh, uh, Northeast and, and Louisiana and Pennsylvania Dutch as a, a form of uh, uh, German, are rapidly declining in size. So in 1970, the 10 largest linguistic communities in the United States were as follows. See, in the United States, not all of them speak only English. So there are, there, there was Spanish spoken in the United States by nine, by 7.9, Million, about eight million people speak speaking French, Spanish. Spanish was the first uh, biggest language um, that was predominating. Yiddish, which is Jewish, was spoken by one and a half million. German by six point two million. Italian by four million. Too many, yeah. And French by about over two and a half million. Polish just under two and a half million and Norwegian, Swedish are 0.6 million. And then we have uh, Slovak and Hungarian, half a million. And that was in 1970. In all, 
about 34 million Americans currently have a mother tongue other than English. So they are considered as bilingual because they learn English in schools and everywhere else. Happily, the English only approach, there are always clever people in England to solve this problem. And uh, the, the attitude, the, the government the approach and the attitude associated with it have almost disappeared from the educational scene in the United Kingdom too. So although there are many Welsh and Gaelic speakers who are very unhappy about the status of their language, Gaelic has been allowed in schools in Gaelic speaking Scottish areas. But that started in 1918, although it was not really until 1958 that was applied and began to be used extensively as a medium of instruction. So here we have to realize that for most children, <coughs> particularly in the second secondary school, English is still the normal medium. So they make them learn their own language, but at the same time, they make English language prevail. It, it prevails. Uh, here on page 125 now, okay, can you all see that? On that page, um, a large number of non gaelic speaking children join schools, of course, and the position of Welsh in the United Kingdom is considerably more healthy than Gaelic. Okay? So it has far more speakers, which is the Welsh, and fairly considerable amount of time are given on the, to the radio, and in the radio and the TV broadcasting, you find them announce uh, you know, the news items and all that in Welsh in certain hours of the day, as in the case of Gaelic. So the effect of the older education approach that lives on many old people today, while being uh, fluent speakers of Welsh, have never learned to write it. Like, you know, Lulua. As a day two, you know, when you learn your Lulua, you know that by saying that in the early, in early 19th, in early 20th century, for example, that's what you say. Like, in any other day, مثلا, لو كان مثلا 1918, you don't really have to worry about this, but at least to have an overall idea. Uh, no, it's not written on the book. Yani, on the book it's written, but very little, yeah, Lulu, and everybody else. I know you are worried about all this information, but this is, you're welcome. This is what is so special about this book. I mean, otherwise, what would you learn about language and nation? You know what's going on with the nations, and what are the basic nations that have these problems, like Scotland and in the United Kingdom, uh, and Wales, and also in America, this and that, and also the Sam, the Sami lap uh, kind of minority problem, and the Yiddish problem, and you know, and all these things, and so on and so forth. Okay, now, we say that the position of Welsh is better because it has got more speakers. So it, yeah, mainly it supported our previous uh, conclusion by saying that minority languages are minority because it's spoken by less number of people. Many older people can are in a better situation than the young generation. Today, the situation is different. It has improved as far as standard Welsh, for example, is concerned because uh, they have to write even the most intimate of letters in the foreign language, which is not English, that was in England, and I'm talking about the Welsh. Uh, English and very often, um, uh, yes, English and very often find it difficult to read standard Welsh, of course. 
all right. And uh, today the situation is a lot more improved and especially since the early 1930s. So what we say is that, and you can sort of have this division in your mind, early 20th century, England um, permitted uh, studying and talking Welsh and Gaelic. Uh, in the first uh, third of the 20th century, the situation improved in the United Kingdom, and there has been a change in emphasis. And around that time, Welsh began to be taught seriously in many primary schools. But the secondary schools still, yes, Welsh. Yeah, Welsh uh, in England. I mean, yeah. That's correct, in Europe. And this is, you find it, I mean, uh, generally as a conclusion for this subsequently in, my, in mid 20th century, which is 1953, a report was published which received Ministry of Education approval, which suggests that all children in Wales should be taught both Welsh and English. And you know, the English, the Arabic, the Arabic, the Arabic. You know, they're trying to protect English and make it as an official language, and at the same time, they're trying to approve uh, teaching Welsh so that they don't have opponents and they don't have problems, okay? Right. What do we have here now? Um, That was the situation of uh, Welsh in the United Kingdom. Uh, another interesting development in the situation of nursery schools, which are solely Welsh-speaking, but to which many English-speaking parents are sending the children in order that they should grow up bilingual. So like apparently many Irish people some of those Welsh parents feel that by adopting the English language, they or their ancestors have in some way been untrue to their cultural tradition. You know, there was that belief in the United Kingdom, like here probably in Saudi Arabia, and some of the uh, uh, Arab uh, instructors or whatever, they believe that if you learn another language, your mother tongue will be distorted. That is rubbish, you know? It's not true. That is really rubbish. It's the other way around. If you learn another language, your mind becomes more broad and you will be able to uh, appreciate more your language and you will learn it even better. Okay, now, if you go to page uh, 126, you will find it talking also about the Welsh and uh, other minority. Languages situation in the world. Okay, let's see what other languages we we were talking about the Welsh. Nevertheless, the future of Celtic, Celtic language of Ireland, all right, in Britain is still very uh, precarious. There was a decline in the number of Gaelic speakers in Scotland from 136 in 1831, it was reduced down to 81,000 in 1931, those learners of Celtic, uh, of Gaelic, sorry, in, uh, in Scotland, and a decline in the number of Welsh speakers over the same period from 902,000 to 656,000 along the years until the middle uh, part of the 20th century. One of the problems faced by Welsh-speaking communities is that of English people moving to Wales and being not only willing to learn Welsh themselves, but also reluctant to have their children educated in Welsh, in Welsh language because all the books and means of education have been developed in English language. Nothing has been developed in, and if they learn the language, they will stop there. 
they won't be able to advance because all science material is uh, developed in English. So here we have uh, the effect of recognizing the child's social and cultural identity and integrity and encourages the development and growth of minority cultures so that it's not lost. It's a pity and it's a shame if it was lost. The position of other European minority languages in education varies considerably. For example, like German, while our majority of languages elsewhere have a clear particular uh, advantage over languages like Gaelic and the Sami Lap, you know, Sami Lap language for which there is a scarcity of teaching materials and reading methods. On, on the other hand, they may be at a political disadvantage in neighboring states. German receives very little encouragement in France, German language. And Macedonian in Greece is actively discouraged. Phrasing, on the other hand, is given some encouragement. So generally, the encouragement is not that much that you find on that page. It continues on this discussion, continues. Uh, on page 127, uh, right? Uh, which is also related to other uh, gypsies and, you know, uh, Czechia language uh, and in Northern Greece, on the other hand, small literary program have been developed for the Romani Romani, Romani speaking children, and so on. And with relation to the to education. Finnish language and uh, during the 19th century, a number of rows, a number rose from 16 to 30 uh, of independent European nation states. Since that time, um, has risen to over 50, so there are rising numbers of them. And it is interesting to, to plot some of the stages of this development, particularly since the movement has not been entirely in one direction. So during the Middle Ages, for example, and that is on page 128, during the Middle Ages, what happened? You can see that uh, large provincial and low German see also below the Arabic ceased to function. Uh, the latter, for example, uh, in Europe alone, has standardized official language. So what about the Arabic? In our nation, we are keeping Arabic as being compulsory in all our schools. Look at Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. During the French occupation, they stopped teaching Arabic at that time, early 19th century, mid 19th century, and end of 19th century. So by the 19th century, all Moroccans and Algerians and uh, uh, Tunisians started to lose their Arabic. But then after the independence, the government uh, put a compulsory rule to uh, make Arabic compulsory to teach in schools and Arabic started to get its position there. And in Libya, same thing with Italy, Italian. Yeah. Okay, read more about these situations and um, You know, uh, it's always that the, the, uh, the decision of the government to deal with the language. So unfortunately, if the government has a broad mentality, a narrow mentality or an unreliable system, then language starts to be lost. See, page 
129. This is discussed there as well, saying that some governments, on the other hand, unfortunately regard some linguistic minorities as potentially subversive. What does subversive mean? Sub subversive. I'll write it down. Try to understand the word. What does subver subversive mean? I.e. destructive. It is to that extent. You know the word destructive? Destructive or, or subversive. In what way? Destructive and they may react very differently and foolishly to prevent the minority language community which are recognized as such as well treated, for example, in education and less likely to become uh, disaffected. So they start fighting those minority and uh, consider using the minority languages as an offense and it becomes against the law. So it really depends on the, uh, the government. So language loyalty can be powerful, can be a powerful weapon. You know, you have your language and you feel that it's your dignity and your identity and all that. Okay? Right. So here, it continues talking about this on all that the kind of that uh, that page. There is the Catalan, the Catalan language, which is used by the minority, I think, in Spain and in Portugal. And this is a Romance language, and it may be, I think, similar, similar to uh, Spanish, and it's closely related to French as it is to Spanish, yeah. So Catalan, in Catalonia, a place called Catalonia, Val Valencia, Valencia, and Balearic, Balearic Islands, Balearic or whatever, as well as about 250 and about a quarter of a million in Rosillon, in France, and very small group in Sardinia. It is also one of the two official languages of Andorra. Okay, uh, the other one is French. And you know, keep on reading about those places and try to figure figure them out. Uh, also, Catalan. Catalan language. Minority is discussed in position and functioning and everything on pages 129 and 130. Read that, it's very important. There is a Catalonian national nationalist and it was uh, concerned about well, what it regarded as uh, separative uh, tendency. So language is a signal of group identity. I'll write that down. Language is a signal of group Identity. I mean, I might give you this statement and ask you to describe it. So reading about this one, you know, will make you able to write to to write something really uh, actual from life. How do the governments react? How does the minority language become strong because of the belief of people in that language, even if they were minority. Can you see here an example of Catalan? So the, the extent of the linguistic problem involved is separately uh, um, related by the following passage in Catalan and its Spanish translation on pages see that on pages you will not of course we don't understand Catalan any or uh, Spanish well, pages 130 and 131 it shows you the two passages 
and you can see the English as well translation for that about uh, migrate uh, only uh, half listen thinking that half Paris will be on holiday and that the rest at this hour will be whatever etc it talks about that kind of uh, I mean uh, relation between Catalan language and Spanish language okay and then it shows the reaction of the Spanish government towards that so Catalan has returned to the domain because of the behavior of its people because they believe in that language and it becomes the media and in education it returns to the media and education from which it has been uh, banished before but then it came back so the same sort of motives were, were found in the, with the British government at that time long time ago the British government prohibited Scots and Gaelic and uh, then because that Scottish people and Welsh people were having high uh, determination and their identity was really strong enough the British government started to realize them and so on so that's what we what we have so here government Uh, must have what we call you know language planning that is a, a very important linguistic term in social linguistics and it is on page C pages 131 and 132 about this this is a very important kind of you know it would plan it would have this planning, I mean, this is the kind of activity of governments having to do with language, uh, having to do with language and uh, deciding about which language has to be first and which language has to be learned at school and what to do with other minority languages, not fighting them. So this language planning is very, very important in very many cases, activities of this kind, unlike many of those we have just described can be regarded as both necessary and commendable for example in countries which are faced with the problem of having to select a national language or language and subsequently of developing and, and standardizing it them or them so this type of language planning which decides which role to be uh, played by language and, and so on is known as status planning so status of language and yani status so language um, planning is related to status planning and yani status planning it refers to the position of the first language and the position of second language and so on for example and this is always needed and required in multilingual societies uh, so multilingualism in Europe requires them and that, that's how they were able to overcome the problem that was their problem in England, in uh, Holland, in the Netherlands and so on. So Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, is a very multilingual area where language problem has been uh, exacerbated because colonial powers drew national frontiers without regard uh, to the geographical distribution so I mean government should not uh, or must not ignore I mean uh, minorities of language linguistic minorities and the indigenous people and and so on right so here the example given here about Africa and uh, African community are those languages and the situation in Uganda so because uh, that community in that community those languages were also familiar with other languages like Luganda, Swahili and English right so here each of these three languages 
was capable of functioning as a lingua franca. That is the word lingua, right? Franca. Do you understand what is a lingua franca? I might ask you this question. What is a lingua franca? A lingua franca is a language which is used as a means of communication, means of communication among people who have no native language in common. Give me an example in our world, in the Arab world of lingua franca. I want you to give me, I mean, if you have people who are not Arabs and they want to communicate in our world, what is a, an example of a lingua franca here? For example, your uh, uh, Nora or Noor, Munira, Maram, Nina. Let's tell me which Moroccan Saudis. Moroccans and Saudis, uh, no, Moroccan and Saudis speak Arabic together, their own dialects. The dialect of Moroccan, the dialect of Saudi Arabia, the Hijazi, whatever. From Sharqiya, from the Middle Najdi, etc. No, 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 no. The lingua franca is a different kind of system. Yeah, I have a different accent, but it's the same language, yellow No, I want you to think about when I say language, a lingua franca language, a language that is created, a system that is different. It doesn't occur between Arabs, Yabanat, La'a. In Al Arab, we use our own dialects, but we speak Arabic. صح واحد بيقول يباوع والثاني يقول يشبح والثاني يقول يشوف والرابع يقول whatever yes bravo okay أفنان what about the Indian what is the lingua franca that they might have to communicate with with us in our country that's how you have to think that is the question that that is related to lingua franca that is used probably in Saudi Arabia and in the Gulf and in our countries. Imagine the situation. You don't imagine. This is the actual situation. We have Indians. What other nationalities do we have which are not Arabs that live in, in our country and they work and everything? We have Indians, right? Uh, Philippines, bravo, Aleki. Yes, of course. Philippines. And and uh, yeah, Philippines and what else? Filipinos. We say Filipinos, and we say Sri Lanka. Huh? From Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, and people from uh, what else? Pakistan, right? You see, I have Pakistan. Pakistan, Pakistanis, and what what else do we have? We have as well, maybe uh, yeah, Indonesian, bravo, yes, Indonesian. And to show about and all these people, Indonesian. Um, ah, right. Well, what is that? Yalulwa, Indonesians and. Uh, Malaysian, that's the one from Malaysia, Malaysian. What else? You don't know how to write it in English. You write in good English. Yeah, and Indonesia, Magbut Katbahainti. So you manage Japanese and Magbut Sahih Kalami, Korean from Korea. So we will say, etc. I want you to understand uh, the word lingua franca. Okay, and others, all of these. Ish bitkallamu ma baad enna. And from Bengali, Bangladesh, Bengali. And from Somalia, kaman yani hatta mumkin mish Somalia. Somalia bitkallamu Arabi wala ish. What do they speak? Somalia and, uh, and all of these. We have maybe nine different uh, nations, nationalities who don't have this. So they have the lingua franca. What is that lingua franca that they speak together? What lingua franca they speak? They speak, we call it pidgin, Arabic, صح? Pidgin Arabic. اللي هي احنا بنفكرها broken. It's not broken. That is the lingua franca that they have. You know, 
and we don't know it ehna so we break our arabic and we talk to them we think that they are breaking the arabic it's not that they breaking the arabic okay so this is the lingua franca and that is on page 132 so many african lingua franca have different than arabic they have the days in our in in the gulf we have it like having arabic days but in africa they have different days of that lingua franca it can be afro asian uh, yeah the, the, it can be mathalan swahili background it can be of uh, you know of all these kinds of lingua franca kinds of uh, afro asian languages spoken originally they taken from them or the muhajjan bravo alek yes lulwa you have got the right word so that muhajjan means that it has a, a basic the base of a system of a certain language it becomes a pigeon broken yani ma pigeon broken pigeon mana uh a kind of big mixed system or structural system another structural system of a same of one language like it another structural system of arabic هذا مهجن معنا داخل في عربي بس في نفس الوقت يعني الستركتشر is different than عربي بقول أنا في يجي أنت في روح هذا في مشكل عربي is not like that but at the same time they speak they use Arabic words and they use some of the inflections of Arabic so مهجن that's what it means exactly مهجن so there are plenty of those lingua francas in Africa lingua francas in uh, مثلا Uh, different parts of uh, America, lingua franca of, uh, especially in in Africa. So this lingua franca, uh, in uh, yeah, for many countries, the original lingua franca, from which the term, which is actually means French language, yeah, lingua franca, asla ma khud min French language. Uh, it, it can be uh, from uh provincial that was used in the lingua franca by the multi lingual christians they the mal salibiin you know and they used to not to know french but they used to have this kind of collected vocabulary and they are used according to their own uh, in india also there is the they use in lingua franca read about this and the bengali speakers and uh, tamil and malaya and you know that colloquial kind of bizar malaya and in the continent and all that tamil and everything you read about this kind of international multi multilingualism and so until read all that read all the explanation related to multi to lingua franca it's a very important point this one i'm telling you and you might have plenty of uh, questions around this all the related information on pages uh, up till uh, 135 all the related information are on lingua franca and i might ask you what is it referring to originally it refers to in french franca is french lingua language yani long france so lingua franca is related to is taken from the word french language and it is uh, mentioned it is found the lingua franca in uh, africa in some parts of spain in the arab world as well there are different lingua franca ha huh? it's not the same language but it is a lingua muhajjan as you said in india as well so you have to remember those examples and keep them in your mind there is also on page something very important on page 135 the language is called esperanto that language was actually a made up language it is a made up 
language by the people yani humna taban esperanto european european union okay by european union and it was taken the, the structure of it was taken from is from spanish and p from uh, yeah or uh, uh, spanish french uh, english e for english s for spanish um e r for yani italian there is as well and it was unlike english or french esperanto is a native language of no one it is not it is it isn't a native language huma alulish why did they uh language why did they invent it they invent it because they say why english is used in the united nations and all over the world let's have a language that has a collection of each language uh, uh of europe and then uh, use it but then it died it died why it then died why did it died i'm sorry why did it die because it was a synthetic language it wasn't naturally developed okay linguistically speaking that is not a possible language to flourish and read all about these yeah one most interesting example of government activity in the field of language planning uh was standardized is provided provided by modern norway and here it talks about children they have to learn them to read and to write both types of languages according to government government planning and that is mentioned on pages 136 137 and 138 okay see about that and uh, in the norwegian situation about the nor region situation okay let me just make sure that the region uh is built like that yes norwegian situation norway and the input can continue to take you to norwegian situation also on pages up till also 139 140 all of these are talking about this is very important 141 and on 141 there is that table which is about the following is useful for diagnosing the province uh, of written publication in bokmal so that bokmal is a language that is used over there so we have political political left and many school books so the book means the uh, book in boka and boka and the two sentences analyzed on pages 142 to the sentences analyzed on pages 142 Uh, two and one hundred and forty-three. Okay, this is important about Norwegian. Uh, a final footnote of the Norwegian linguistic scene: Norway actually has two names in Norwegian. It has Negro and Nynorsk and Norge in uh, Bokman. So we say we saw that under Danish rule. Norwegian dialect becomes uh, heterogeneous. Yani, uh, it was mixing together, 
and look at the table on those pages 142 and 143 for more examples of that. And then in provincial and low German, on the other hand, were formerly uh, autonomous. So please read about the heterogeneous and the autonomous types of languages. Try to understand them. And heterogeneous, het, ro, g, none, and try to understand this. Heteronymous and autonomous. And um, about uh, German and about the lowland Scotland and about English and all that, they become like uh, one type of uh, uh, language level and autonomy can also be disputed here because Catalan, remember that language, was part of the same dialect of a continuum as Spanish and then because it becomes a minority then because it becomes uh, you know, uh, inferior in other words. Similarly, in the former Yugoslavia, remember that, we talked a lot about it. So we have this multilingual society, also uh, American, British and American English, uh, which are unlike any, they are different uh, examples than Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia. We have the serbo Croat, and the serbo Croat is one language or three. We said is it a Serbian language or a Croat language or the language of the Bosnian. And it's the same language, but it is related to the identity problem. Okay, and I think because this chapter is quite long, we were not able to finish it. So we will leave language and geography for next class. And inshallah, we'll have enough time to try and cover, you know, uh, uh, chapters uh, 8, 9, and 10, or maybe 8 and 9. And next week we do chapter 10 and your questions. Yeah, I was trying my best to cover the two chapters because I think chapter language and nation, which is chapter 7, is quite long. And we only have five minutes left in our class. This is why I don't think we can sort of manage any yeah, starting with language and geography. Okay, to end up the chapter, and a conclusion. And that is on page 146. Are you all with me, Banat? Uh, I feel I'm talking, I'm talking, and you are, are you with me? Noura, Noor, uh, thank you. Thank you, Maram, Munira, Lina, Lulwa. There is one thing I want to tell you before I leave, <laughs> before you leave. Yeah, young lady, you all have to sign out. When we say, Yalla, oh, khalas, now everything, you all have, if you don't sign out, I will have to take you out. If I took you out, I will be removing you as a as participant so that I can close the system and keep the recording. So please, everybody, don't leave. First, sign out and then leave. If you don't, I will wait. I'll be wait. I, yesterday I was waiting for maybe 10 minutes. One of the girls, I don't remember her name. I had to remove her from the list. So she can't now sign in anymore. But I don't want to do that. Please try to remember this. Thank you very much. Okay, so, so here, in order to conclude, uh, we say that some, uh, some languages uh, become the standard variety and which are superposed over a continuum of dialects uh, for social historical reasons and also become heterogeneous, heteronymous uh, uh, to them. Uh, for example, Hosbu languages are there for separate languages uh, by reasons of their political, cultural, and social, as well as their linguistic characteristics. So there are also, however, some languages of which this is not true, and which can be regarded as 
languages in their own right uh, on purely linguistic grounds. Uh, we can remember that language Basque or language of, uh, by distance in German, any abstand language, because it is linguistically so different from all other languages, and that is its status as an independent, right, independent language, and it cannot be disputed. So not even the Franco regime could claim that Basque was really Spanish. So here we have all these reasons in language planning and the status planning as well of the language. The reasons can be social, can be political, can be uh, linguistic, can be cultural as well. So read that chapter please thoroughly before we actually start our next chapter which is language and geography so that we start if you have any, any question and then we start with the chapter. Do you have any question before we leave? Young ladies, Afnan, Salwa, Abir, Fatma, Lul, Walina, Maram, Munira, Noor, Noora, and all of you. And we have good number. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot and all the best until I see you after tomorrow, inshallah. Goodbye. And as we always say, في أمان الله في أمان الله يلا try to sign out please thank you